Welcome to the Black Writers Studio, a podcast presented by the Hurston Wright Foundation and hosted by Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman. The Black Writers Studio is dedicated to showcasing Black writers who are transforming the world today with their literary pen and creating a legacy for the culture. Troy D. Johnson, a luminary in black literature and culture, is renowned for his transformative impact across multiple spheres. As the visionary founder of the African American Literature Book Club, AALBC, and president of AALBC.com, he has forged essential pathways for black writers, authors, and literary professionals. Johnson's stewardship of AALBC has cultivated a dynamic platform amplifying black voices and narratives in mainstream literary arenas. His steadfast dedication to celebrating black culture through literature ensures the preservation and promotion of its rich legacy connecting generations to their heritage. A tireless advocate for diversity in publishing Johnson addresses systemic biases by providing a vital space for black authors to thrive. Under his leadership, AALBC has blossomed into a global hub, offering readers access to a diverse array of black literature and fostering community engagement. So it's really um, funny. I, I think many people can relate to the sentiment that you follow someone um, on social media or you're so familiar with someone's work that sometimes you're under the impression that you've had a full-fledged conversation with them or that you know them (laughs) in a way better than you do. And I have to say that that is how I feel about you, Troy Johnson, is that I have been a fan of your work and a follower of your work for years, for decades. Um, And to the point that, it really startled me when we did engage um, via email um, for the first time that this is the first time that we really had com- communication wow, with that's... each other. Wow. And, and so I just want to welcome you. I want to um, tell you congratulations so much for being selected this year as a Madam C.J. Walker honoree um, as part of our Legacy Awards. Um, recognition and is so well deserved and I think it's one of those things like about time like you know what we're waiting for Um, but thank you for joining me today in Black Writer Studio so that I can um, talk with you and just share with you um, how I feel about you but also learn about what really put you on this journey um, to to be one of, if not the oldest online bookstore selling books um, written by Black authors and about Black people? Well, well, first, let me just say, Khadija, that it's, you know, it's great to be seen. I mean, like, literally seen and understood. I mean, and, you know, just briefly speaking with you, you, you get you get it. You, you understand the, the difficulty of what we do, not just yes. me, but this community of people who are bringing together diverse set of skills and to to the upliftment and celebration of black books and the writers who create them. But um, you know, my, you know, you asked how did I get started or what started me in it? It, it was pure serendipity. I just I never planned it. It wasn't anything I trained for. Um, you know, I really, you know, I always was tech oriented. Yeah. And when the web first became available, I um to the public to create websites. Mm-hmm. The uh, I had um, a sideline business selling personal computers, you know, because I was into tinkering with computers. So I, I would custom build computers and sell them to people and teach them how to use it. This is back in the in the early 90s where computers were really expensive yeah. and hard to use. So I, you know, I had a sideline doing that. And um, I decided to build a website, you know, to promote that business. And as soon as I created that website, I said, well, you know what? This is a lot easier than schlepping computers around and dealing with people's tech issues. Let me just build websites for other people. Oh. And I did that for, you know, over a year. And one of my customers, um, she um, had a business selling hand, 
press flowers. Like if you press flowers, they'll preserve forever. And she had a lot of creative artwork and I still have some of it hanging in my home. And uh, she liked the website. And my model at the time was to charge people a monthly fee to maintain their website. Oh. And um, she liked the site, but she couldn't, she didn't, she wasn't generating, generating enough in, uh, sales to justify maintaining the website. Now, in hindsight, I would have just kept her site up and worked with her. But what I did was I did take it down. And um, I said, well, let me build a website and try to figure out this e-commerce thing. Mm -hmm. And I decided to sell books. And actually, the reason I decided to sell books was because there was uh, someone that I knew that had was selling books on the web. Uh, but there, I knew their website couldn't possibly be working for them for a variety of reasons. So I offered to rebuild it for them. And they declined. Oh, wow. And I was really surprised by that, actually. But... I said, well, you know what? I'll build I'll build a book website uh, myself. I'll just, you know, build this. And at the time, Barnes and Noble had, and they still have an affiliate program where, you know, someone sees a book on your site, they click it, and you get a percentage of that sale. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did that. So I set up a site. It was actually just a folder on my site, on my main, and it was called Johnson PC Consultants. And so um there was a forward slash AALBC, which stood for African American Literature Book Club. And you could see it on the Wayback Machine. This, you know, so this this was might have been, I don't know, it, it was 1997. Wow. And I, okay. Almost exactly, almost exactly 26 years ago, right? Wow. 97, 23, yeah. To the day. Like it was in October no way. of 1990. It may literally be the 26th anniversaries when I first sat down to create the site. Wow. So I um, I built the site. And as soon as I started acquiring, looking at books to put on the site, I was just floored. You know, I, there was so much I didn't know. Mm. You know, I wasn't an avid reader and consuming nonfiction and fiction. I, you know, I read mm -hmm. and I, I had a library of books and my, I read to my children every night. So I had an appreciation for books, but I just didn't know. I was just completely unaware of the variety of literature that was out there. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the, the late 90s, and it wasn't as if there was a great deal of books yeah, out there, but it right. just completely escaped, escaped my scrutiny. I just, right. So when I created the website, you know, I was discovering authors and books. And when I set up the site, uh, there was an immediate... Uh, a community of people that came to the site and embraced it, you know, and by, so within a couple of months, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So I stopped building websites for everybody else. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do. Wow. And, you know, so selling books as an affiliate of Barnes & Noble wouldn't, didn't pay the bills. Right, right, right. Um, you know, it was just extra money on the side. And um, I never would have envisioned that this would be my life, become my livelihood. It just never occurred to me. Wow. And, um, you when know, you so, say when you say that um people responded to it, what was it both readers and writers or was oh, it book clubs? What what did that community look like? Yeah, all of that. It was it was book clubs, it was readers, it was writers, it was, you know, just you know, authors who want to get their books out to a larger audience, mm -hmm. readers who were thanking me for discovering a book that they were previously unaware of. Oh, wow. And, you know, and, and, the, and the whole time I'm, you know, like my favorite customer, you know, <laughs> because I'm doing the same thing these people are. Right. You know, there was a, a, a guy that joined the site. And so I started the site in 1997. And in 1998, March, I registered the domain, aalbc.com. And, you know, so that was March of 20, March of 98. So was it, what, then, was it like it is now um, where you have the chat rooms and you have the list? So, I mean, cause your, your site, I don't even think folks realize that it's not just like a marketplace, like an Amazon. It's, it's a, 
multimodal site. So you have the the book, the marketplace, you have chat groups. So it's literally community brewing on it. Then you have the blogging. So you have lists that you've put together. Um, Hurston Wright is appreciative. I mean, every year you do a legacy, a list of the legacy books. Um, so you do, it's all of these things. So when you started, was it that, or did that kind of come later? Um, it, a lot of it evolved over time. And, okay. you know, but, you know, one of, you know, for example, it, the site is called the African-American Literature Book Club, but I didn't start out as a book club. It was just a place to buy oh, books. Right. But early on in early in 1998, early 1998, uh, a guy who used the, the name Thumper, he um, immediately volunteered to moderate the discussion for our, our our online book club and one of the discussion forums. The if, indeed over after a couple of years, I actually named the discussion forum after him called and called it Thumper's Corner. Ah. But this guy, he read voraciously. Mm. He consumed books. He wrote reviews. He may have written, I haven't looked at it lately, but at least at this point, a couple of hundred book reviews for the site. Wow. And he was one of those guys that loved or hated, you know, he loved books. He said that. If he hated a book. He said it. He, you know, and readers really appreciated his reviews because if he read a book and he disliked it, he would let you know. And no right. uncertain, he wasn't mincing words. <laughs> but if he loved the book, it was the same. It was the same type of embracement. He, you know, he, he embraced the book the same way. Right. But um, so because of him, the discussion forums really kind of blossomed. Uh, the book club. He we ran that for at least ten straight years. Wow. The first book that he picked was a book you know I never heard of. It was called uh, Cain by Jing Tumor, oh. and for me. I would never have picked that book. Right. He introduced me to the book and it was an incredible book. It just was written like nothing else I had read before. Mm. You know, I'd never heard of the author. I'd never heard of the book. And, you know, he's from the Gene, Gene Toomer's from the Harlem Renaissance. Right. And, you know, so, yeah, over the years, I learned about the Harlem Renaissance period. I grew up in Harlem. I didn't know anything about the Harlem Renaissance, really, the literary right. experience and the writers from that period. So, so we ran an a online book club. Uh, we had I would host chats with authors. I, you know, I recall um, doing one with Guy Johnson. Uh, Guy Johnson is Maya Angelou's son. Mm -hmm. He uh, wrote a book called Standing at the Scratch Line that I have not met a person who didn't thoroughly not a guy anyway, who did not thoroughly enjoy this book. Wow. And uh, so we did a chat. I, I did a chat with them, but it was really challenging because we didn't have what we have today. So. Right, right. And so I actually had him on the phone and I was reading what was on the screen. He would tell me what his answer was and I would put it in the chat room on his behalf. Wow. And we did a chat session that way. And it, that it should be still online. So we did chats like that. And the discussion forums have been online for 25 years. Yeah. You know, but, you know, over the years, the site has necessarily changed. Right. Because of changes in technology, right. changes, in, changes in what is happening elsewhere on the web. Right. You know, there are, you know, a lot of changes, good and bad and different that have really changed the nature of what I do online right. and um you know everything from you know Amazon's create you know Amazon really kind of launched around the same time I did right. uh, with their growth um the dominance of Google search engine uh, the rise of social media technology changes you know AI today is is something I need to reckon with yeah. and uh and indeed you know I'm you know, we're rebuilding this. I'm, you know, actually have some people working with me to actually rebuild the site yeah. because up until this point, you know, every single data bit you see online, I, you've I done. put up there. You've I done. Did all so, so, so let me ask that question. I think that um, it, it needs to be asked because I think it's significant for us to 
and for you to point out that um, you, you, your site and Amazon started around the same time, you are not a billionaire. Um, you did not have an investment from wealthy parents into your business. Tell me about what some of the um, the the highlights have been in terms of funding or attracting certain people to help support your business, but what some of those challenges have been. I think it's really important for us um, who, you know, Black leaders of organizations to talk about the importance, because this is across the board. If we think about HBCUs, if we think about um, Black businesses, Black nonprofits that are led and founded by Black people, that oftentimes if you um, if you look at the data, we aren't supported in the same ways. We don't attract the investment. We don't attract the individual donors and the, right. the, the things necessary to sustain us. And you and I were talking offline about, you know, when I was sharing all the things that I do as executive director of this nonprofit, but all of the things that you've done for this 20 plus years in the game, still having to be hands on in multiple roles. What are those those ways that you've you've garnered support? And what are those what what are your thoughts on the ways that our community can support more to in, ensure that we not only have the sustainability, but we can yeah. create the succession plan necessary to 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 be around. You know, we can spend the next that that's a big question. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, I'll, I'll relate a number of anecdotes, you know, to kind of help tell that story, but it's an important one. So, you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, Amazon story is a whole complete, you know, yeah, he started in his garage and to sell books online. That's only part of the story. Right. The real story is that Jeff was far more sophisticated than I was at the time. He came out of, you know, Wall Street and, you know, he had funding to develop this company that ultimately, you know, was an emerging monopoly. And, and I have to believe they knew what they were doing up front right. and they executed brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the the backing of venture firms at Wall Street, and, you know, obviously the support of the community and brilliant ex execution. You know, he, he was just doing something that was a whole nother thing. I'm, oh. I'm trying to celebrate and share Black culture, which is, you know, I wasn't, my, I wasn't in I'm in it for the money now because I, I have to live, but my motivation is not money. And indeed, the motivation of many of us who do this is not purely money. Although, you know, I had a job, my last corporate job was with Goldman Sachs. If I want to make money, I would have stayed there. Right. But the that is not what drives us. Right. That said, we have to, there are incubators, there are sources of funding, you know, there are ways that we could be more sophisticated in terms of how we run our businesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at this late, late stage, I'm actually just beginning to do some of that. Yeah. So I, I've worked with a company called Builders and Backers, and they've provided some seed funding to help me get this website redesigned. Oh, so wow. it's it might sound great that I built this site from scratch. And I think that does speak that does say something. But I can't do, I can't know everything that needs to be known. I can't do everything that needs to be done to make this a truly world-class platform to help people connect with, you know, the Black books they're going to enjoy the most. It's just, mm -hmm. I can't do it alone. Right. Um, so there are resources out there. And as I've become more sophisticated in that space, I begin to take more advantage of those. The other thing is, you know, I hate to say this, but it's my impression when I first started was that, hey, there's this book site run by a black man selling black books. Black people will flock to it. That's just going to happen. And if you that no, that does not happen. That right. Black people aren't going to buy from you just because you're black. And then there's some that will argue not only will they not buy you, you have to be better than the alternative. And the alternatives and Amazon perhaps is I cannot compete with Amazon mm -hmm. by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, no one can, pe can compete with Amazon at this point. But what I say that to say is that we're kind of held at a, a very high standard, a high standard 
relative to um, you know our white counterparts. You know, because we're operating alone, we're doing everything ourselves, and you know that's the reality. Of it. How to fix that? We have to work together. We have to, you know, one of the other unfortunate things is that, you know, where I'll say it this way, when about a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago, I wanted to create a black bestsellers list. And that required working with other booksellers. And it also required sharing information and time and resources. And one of the women, um, in fact, I mentioned a grant, Gwen Richardson from Cush City, which started just shortly after I did on the web selling books. They had a brick and mortar store in, in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I was really kind of lamenting the fact that it was difficult to get a lot of support for this project. And Gwen explained to me that, you know, people work really hard, they create a business, and they're not keen on sharing, sharing the resources because they're afraid that people who aren't as diligent, haven't put in the work, will just try to exploit that. Right. And and I saw that, you know, she was right in that regard. So there's a lot of apprehension. Um, so there's reluctance from people who've been in the game for a minute to yeah. work with newcomers mm -hmm. because they don't want to, you know, be taken advantage of. And then there's, you know, a, a kind of disincentive for people to cooperate because you're really struggling to maintain your business. Right. So it's it's and, and and you're operating in an environment where you kind of have to work at a really high, high level mm -hmm. in order to um, get business that, you know, other groups get bought just because, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the the really uh, interesting thing, you know, this is slightly off your, 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 your question, but it's related. So in 2022, on the heels of George Floyd public execution, there was uh, across the country, people of all colors and backgrounds wanted to buy books, um, mainly on anti-racism topics, which, you know, really put uh, uh, Kendi, Ibrahim Kendi in the spotlight. But um, they, and they wanted to buy those books from Black booksellers. Mm -hmm. And most Black booksellers had wreckage years. You know, in, in June of 2020, I had, a, I sold more books that month than I sold the entire prior year. Prior year. Wow. It, it, it was, and in fact, I could have sold more, but there are a variety of reasons why that didn't happen. But um, many booksellers, um, you know, had record sales. And because it was near the start of the pandemic, these same booksellers were actually facing closure. You know, right, they were, right. the pandemic created an existential threat to many of these booksellers. And, um, you know, George Floyd's murder had the positive impact of creating a, a great deal of um, support for independent booksellers, including AALBC. And, uh, and I thought, and what that told me a couple of things. One, there's, there's tremendous support out there. In other words, you know, we all should be thriving. The, the, there's, and it's not like everybody out there went to black bookstores, but there was enough people that they created, in many cases, life-changing uh, profits for some booksellers. And, um, you know, I would love to see that be something that's sustained. But in order to sustain it, you know, we don't want people being, you know, publicly murdered. Right. right but right. We, we do need to recognize that if you support, you know, any booksellers like an AOBC, you're 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 creating a, an environment where you can help uplift and support not just my business, but the writers who I support, the writers whose books I sell the writers who books I'm starting to publish now. And, and that's uh, talk, that that's where I wanted to go cuz that and that's where I see this leading because as you are talking about the ways you are unhanding some of the things that you have been doing operationally and realizing that bringing people in to help um is a a a, a method 
towards sustainability. I also know and see you broadening what it is that your brand is doing, where it's now not just selling books, but you are now publishing books. And so I'd love to know, like, how did that transition start to happen? Because that's fairly new within the last two years, right? Yeah, it is. So yeah, it's been less than a year since I published my first book. Oh, wow. And indeed, in fact, Kalisha Buchanan, who, Kalisha Buchanan, who you, um, Hurston Wright recognized as a debut fiction writer, yes. um, is one of, is the, was the first author I published. And um, I think it, it really kind of demonstrates what the work that you all are doing in uplifting authors and helping to build careers and then authors turning around and, you know, supporting indie publishers. And it's, it's all great. Now, you know, we just have to, you know, help the community understand the importance of, of, of that yeah. and how they can support it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I've expanded into doing that primarily because there was so much demand from people who would visit the site and say, Hey, I wrote a book and I'd like to get it published. And, and it wasn't something I was interested in doing mm -hmm. because I know how much work it is. And, and, right. and in fact, I know much more clearly how much work it is in, in order to do a good job with that. And, you know, one of the things that I'm happy with this product is that it, you know, every, all of the professionals that worked on it um, was black mm -hmm. and not, you know, and quality. They did a great job with, with the book. And I think it, you know, stands up with any book published by a, a major house. It's a beautiful book. I, in fact, Alicia did design the cover, you know. I mean, we had to do the back cover and the inside bit, but, you know, this this image, yeah, you know, she designed that herself. So she's wow. actually a multi-talented writer. Yeah, that's beautiful. A, a person. And, um, but again, it's, you know, how, all right, so now the book is promoted, published, but, you know, how do we take advantage of our, platforms in order to promote this type of book and and you know ensure that it gets out to a broader audience and so that that's still you know a challenge for any in fact it's a challenge for every publisher right. um but it's increasingly uh it's more of a challenge for uh, indie publishers because financial constraints and time and you know you know all the rest right, right, but right. I, yeah so but i think that um you know, and I, I think that we need to get to a point, and I'm working on this type of thing through another project of mine, uh, of, you know, really being able to dis determine ourselves which books are important and which books need to be shared and, and get them out and really move the needle, so to speak, on sales for these books. Not only sale, you know, discoverability, you know, and selling books that we ourselves I truly believe are important. And, you know, we can't rely, say, on the New York Times bestsellers list to determine which books are important and which ones we should be reading. You know, Hurston yes. Wright clearly, clearly does that. Um, but we should be able, you know, an AOBC and the broader, what I describe as the Black book ecosystem, right. should be able to say, hey, you know, this book won the, an award, Hurston Wright. Everybody in this country should be aware of it. And those people who like to read in this genre should absolutely purchase it. And I deal, ideally purchase it from an independent bookseller. Right. Um, you know, that would be Nirvana in, in right. my in my eyes. Right, so right, right, right. clearly the books that you nominate are, are excellent books. Whether they win or not, the, the whole slate is going to be a quality read. That's one right. of the reasons why I share the list. But, because... but, but you speak to this ecosystem where what is the what is the community that goes into the actual production of this book? And that is so vital. That's that's such a vital um, consideration and conversation to have when we are, I mean, we do it with our food. You know, those are the things that come up when we think about the food ecosystem, you know, thinking about from farm to plate. Table, yeah. it's, 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 it's the same thing with the book. What is that? what went into that um, production, pre-production, production and post-production. And so I just, I think that that you are now stepping into what, when we even think about the existence of Hurston Wright as a nonprofit, it's really um, at acknowledging 
a publishing industry that is has inherently been inequitable. And so now as you are moving from, or not moving from, but including in your brand, the, the, the selling of the book, you're now looking at the creation of the book. It, 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 it is definitely a different um, stop when we think of this ecosystem. Tell me how um, authors who are listening to this and like, oh my goodness, there's a publishing arm. Tell me how authors can get connected to you. Is is there, what is your your um, your setup now where as a publishing company, do you have editors who um, folks can submit their manuscripts to? What is that process? Or is it, are you curating a list based on invitation only? Yeah, it's right now. So right now at this instant, this is October, um, 2023, my primary focus is, is um, getting this website redesigned, completed, and done. Once that's completed and the site can actually scale and, and I can do things that I, I can't do now, then perhaps at that point I will, you know, look at, you know, publishing uh, more formally. And and I need to bring on people to do that, mm -hmm. you know. And and that's so the you know the the next book I published and I don't want is this book and I bring this up because of uh, the author is coming with me. He'll be at the Hurston Wright uh, Awards, and we're going to be at Sankofa um, the on the following Saturday, and we'll be um, hopefully at Mahogany Books as well. Oh, wow. And Does that mean you're staying in D.C. the entire month? Is that what that is? I'm staying in D.C. <laughs> for five days. Oh, wonderful. But, um, yeah, so, and this book is going to go to support Anthony Browder's work, who you, you would be familiar with coming yes. out of tell, Washington. Tell folks who Anthony Browder is who don't know, Um, but he was definitely, I, I had the pleasure of meeting him two weeks ago at the International Black Writers Festival. And um, my partner and I were able to tell him that his work, tell him directly that his work was um pivotal in our homeschooling journey with our daughter. Really? Um, yeah, the Browder okay. Files. I mean, because I grew up with um Anthony Browder. My mother introduced him, his work to me when I was younger. And so um, my daughter had his essays um very early elementary i would have her read and then um write her feedback um I, just really I, analyzing his work so I, again this whole community so in addition to kwame alexander who's a, one of the top off children's book writers out there uh browder uh, wrote a really nice blurb for the for the book um and 25 percent of the proceeds for the sale of Jelani's Key, which is a middle grade book for uh, young boys, largely eight to 14, 25% uh, of the profits are gonna go to as ASA Restoration Project. Uh -huh. And you know, yeah, yeah. So and I keep interrupting you, but I, and, and asking you to tell about that. And, but I'm excited about that. Cause I, if I um, am thinking correctly about what you're mentioning, his work that he does in Egypt. Right. Okay. Yeah, so okay. That so yeah, you tell. So, in fact, no, <laughs> the so the author um, also participates in the excavation. So, uh, Anthony Browder, oh. um, he, um, in addition to writing books, the Browder Files and uh, the, the Nile on the Potomac, and mm -hmm. doing tours in DC to show kind of the uh, uh, comedic influence on Washington. Those Houston. are the Tony Brown of um, field trips for folks who are interested. He says they are field trips, not tours. I'd I'd want to correct you so he doesn't yeah. get on me if he happens to see <laughs> this. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thank Where you. Where he for does he he takes you throughout Washington D.C. to show the Egyptian influence on the layouts of the city, um, the Masonic influence as well, um, but just everything from the Meridian line. Um, for those of us who are familiar with U Street, um, that street, 16th Street, that is a Meridian line. Um, and he'll even take you through um, what we call Malcolm X Park. Those of us in DC, it's called Meridian Park, Hill Park, um, show you the different um, symbols that are in the park that are um, found 
um, throughout Egypt as well. It's a fantastic wow. <laughs> field trip. I've um, recommended it to folks, gone more than once. I've um, paid for people to go. My daughter's gone uh, more times than I have. So, yeah. So, again, this this the whole synergy that we're described with just two books. I mean, the yeah. only two books that I've published so far, there's a third one coming up, but the only two books that I've published so far are firmly integrated in, in your life experience. And, yes, and, that's and, and, wonderful. And, but I, so, but there are, gonna be, there are people who are listening to this who have never heard of, of the Browder Files or Tony Anthony Browder, who may not be familiar with Kalisha Buchanan, who may not be familiar with the African-American Literature Book Club. And so, you know, how do we, you know, part of the, and this is another sidebar, but it's important, I think, to mention is that how do people discover this video, right? So how do they, how will they find it? And how, you know, so we'll put it on, for example, on YouTube, you know, but YouTube has no interest in elevating these types of videos, their algorithm is just simply not designed for that. Their algorithm is designed to present to you the videos that are gonna captivate you and keep you doing this on your cell phone. And the videos that tend to do that are the videos that are scandalous or have some type of controversy or gossipy, so, you know, celebrity dysfunction, you know, all this stuff that generates revenue, for them, that maximizes their revenue. And so if we want to share, you know, our books, um, you know, we are increasingly um, that it has come under increasing control by really monopolies who, you know, Google literally determines discoverability of websites. You know, there are other search engines, but if you add up all the other search engines, they serve fewer searches than Google does by themselves. And because of that, Google controls how websites are found. And they I'll give you another anecdote. Back in 2011, and this is ancient, ancient history as far as the web is concerned, but in 2011, Google had an uh, update called Panda. This is, I don't want to get too wonky, but basically what Google did is they modified their search algorithm such that um, it resulted in many Black-owned websites, including all of the um, uh, national, the, including the Black-owned newspapers, losing a ton of traffic overnight, going like this yeah. to this. Mm -hmm. AOBC lost 75% of, I lost 75% of my traffic wow. in one day. Wow. It took me five years to recover that. Wow. Many websites never recovered and died. Why? Right. And that and that was never discussed. It was never an issue. Yeah. It, it just never permeated the the web in terms of help people understanding what happened, why it happened, and what yep. was the consequence. Yep. So when you have monopolies. This is what, ha these are things that can happen. Google yeah. could put me out of business tomorrow. Yes. They, yeah. you know, please Google, but no, they <laughs> yeah. really could. Yeah. And they have done that. Yeah. And I'm not saying I that that's I had, a I had a digital community um, that I started in 2008 and I closed it at 2012 for the reasons that you state. Is that yeah. it was, I wasn't getting, I, I, there were new members coming to my community. So the problem is most of us had no clue what happened. Yeah. None. None. They were oblivious to it. Mm -hmm. I actually figured out part of the problem and why it happened. And um, I'm going to get into the details right now, but Google just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But it was a profoundly consequential mistake. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, because they have no accountability, it went on. No one's talk. No one's lamenting the loss of many Black websites, mm -hmm. there were sites that I aspired to be like, mm -hmm. you know, like they were doing really good things that, do, that are gone right. because they were undiscoverable. Right. And so when you say in, in, two, in, you said 2008, you were in the, you know, like you're really kind of trying to launch in the midst right. of Google's burying 
you know, right. and, and I'm not do you, saying. Do you, I, do you remember like the Ning networks that were really popular around that time? Yeah. 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 And in fact, you know, so one of the reasons the site has remained viable is because, well, one, I made a lot of sacrifices to do that, but I paid attention to Google's mandates mm. and I tried to do the best I could to adhere to them. And one of the mandates, when you talk about Ning, um, Google, in the, before Google came around, the way you discover websites is you would go to Troy's site and Troy would say, hey, I like Bronze site or right. Mosaic Books. And you would see the link from Mosaic yes. Books. And you would go to Mosaic Books yes. and Mosaic Books might say, hey, I like Hurston Wright. And you go to Hurston Wright yes. and Hurston Wright might say, I like the Ernest Gaines site. And, you right. know, so that you I remember this, those days of blogging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you created this web of right. interconnectivity and people would discover websites that way. Introduce Google. Google says, all right, we're going to judge you based upon the quality of the sites that you link to, or indeed that link to you. So now I'm responsible for the quality of sites that link to me because people would engage in link schemes in order to gain Google. So you couldn't gain me and say, hey, Troy, you know, I got this porn site I want you to link to and I'll give you some money. No, I'm not doing that. Why? But with Google, you can, through link schemes, get links to websites and, you know, you could build bogus websites and link to your site and then charge other people to get these bogus websites to link to yours to increase, you know, your link juice. And in theory, your rankings on the web. So Google did this. I think that is helpful for folks to know who get those emails from people asking, can they add something or just do some links on your website? Because I think yeah. that that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that that yeah. So they become a bit more sophisticated. Right. And if Google learns about it, it could literally kill your business. Oh wow. And I, that's really what happened with the panda update to you know really describe it. So when they did that, they created a disincentive for websites to link to other websites. And so websites, particularly big ones, prominent ones, literally stopped linking to other websites because the risks were too high. Yeah. You know, if, if you, you know, and I've gotten requests from, you know, early in the early days, a website reached out to me and I had a page about Maya Angelou that was pretty popular. And she's from Stamps, Arkansas. So this company Stamps that exists now, Stamps.com, paid somebody to hyperlink Stamps, Arkansas to Stamps.com. Mm. And they paid me, I don't know, a few hundred bucks for that. And, um, you know, I didn't think of, you know, I really wasn't thinking about it in terms of SEO. But some years later, they came back and asked me to rip that out. Because some other black hat SEO guru probably said, hey, you got these links, paid links going into your site. You need to get rid of them if you want to rank better in Google. Wow. So the whole thing now, so not, not, we're in an environment now where Google is being constantly gamed in order to help sites, you know, rank and search. However, the and they've destroyed the interlinking between other websites. Wow. So I, I still link to them. I link to every other black book bookstore, newspaper, author website. I don't care. I'll, you know, so that's one place where I won't. Um, I'll just say, well, Google kill me if you want to do that, because I'm going to do that. Why, 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 but, why? you know, I really don't kill me, Google, but <laughs> I, just, I just can't. Right. See, that destroys the nature of the web. Right. And but but even can can I just point out that as you break down this very capitalist system of how we navigate this space, which is another world for us, that you are still tethered to this commitment to be um, culturally be a, a culture keeper and to have care with how it is that um, we engage with one another around this art. And I just I just want to pause and, and just give you props for that, um, which it just 
even another layer to the reason why I appreciate you so deeply um, is because it is, it's just a game. It's such a, it's such a game. And, you know, when we get into what, what is so saddening about being an artist or being any type of, of being an arts administrator, I wear all the hats. <laughs> I wear it. So do you, you wear so many hats, but to be part of this and to just be part of it for the love of culture and wanting to to help sustain it, but having to still be privy to these these capitalist games that um, you have to make a decision on what game you will play and which game you will opt out of. And I just think it's so important that that you're sharing this part of it with us. So yeah, so all of that. So I'm 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 gonna um, say that it has been a pleasure having you in the Black Writer Studio. I really look to um, future connections between our organization, but I really um, hold you up um, as you. as a beacon and thank you for all the work that you do in our community. And you did ask me to say where I can be found. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Troy Johnson, the African-American Literature Book Club um, can be found on uh, at aalbc.com. Uh, we sell books, publish books, uh, have host discussion forums, uh, shoot video of authors, have tons of author profiles, uh, share a terrific list of Black-owned bookstores, a list of Black book festivals and fairs. Yes. Um, we do it a, a whole lot, you know, just, you know, come check out the site, leave a comment, share with your friends, and um, help support and celebrate Black books and writers. Wow. Wow.